Welcome, welcome. Getting people coming in for day two of HDO Congress. I'm always excited just to see those numbers pop up, but we'll give it a we'll give it a you know a minute or two just to get everyone on board before we get started. This is where I'm like, I need some music just to get it going, you know, some background music. <laughs> Awesome. All right. So I see I see a, a handful now that are that are in here. So just want to say welcome again, everyone. Day two of HEO's virtual Congress. We're excited to have you here today for a full day of some amazing sessions. And we're excited to kind of start the day with this casual conversation with Roach featuring Peter McColgan uh, from Roach. I hope I got that right. The last name and then Dr. Lauren Byrne and myself. Uh, we are both HDO board members, and so really the goal of this is to have this this conversation to get some updates on uh, the you know the latest Roche study, what it entails, and you know I know we're going to just kind of have I, I would say more of an informal conversation about this. And so if you do have questions, feel free to submit it either using the Q and A feature uh, below. Uh, below your zoom or in the chat and we'll do our best to answer all of them but with that being said I'm going to kick it on over to Dr. Lauren Byrne to get us started. Hi guys um, it's great to be here for the session and we're really excited to do it in this format particularly because um, I feel like sometimes over the last year or two some of the announcements on in the virtual format and presentation format can be harder to understand and harder to get the information that we maybe want from it. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter for a number of reasons. I've been working with Peter at the UCL HD Center um, since 2015, um, before he moved to Roche last year. Um, but he's still, um, so he is a neurologist um, and has seen many, many Huntington's patients and continues to see Huntington's patients who I don't know, um, some people might not know this about Peter. And, um, I think it's quite unique to have a clinical director in a program that has such experience with the patients that they're working on. So um, the other thing is that um, Peter and I are share our or, um, story of origin, um, both being from uh, Northern Ireland. So we have unusual accents that um, Seth is going to help us make sure we don't get too Northern Irish and make it very difficult for our live translators. Um, with that being said, um, we're going to start off with Peter kind of giving an update on where we are, what's happened in the last year since um, all of us know the um, announcements in March last year when the trial, the Tom and Larson Raj program, the phase three, was halted. Um, there have been a number of updates since then, um, and I was at the CHDI HD Therapeutics Conference last week, and Peter had another opportunity to give some newer findings and a bit more information on the, the next plan trial that they're going to be working on. So I think I'm going to hand it over to Peter to kind of give us a general overview. Um, we've warned Peter that we are going to question anything that we don't think is, not, is hard to understand. Um, Seth, from uh, I'm from a scientific background and work um, with biomarkers and stuff, so some of these things come a little easier to me, but Seth's going to balance it out um, and make sure this is going to be as um, accessible for, for you guys as, as possible. So over to you, Peter. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, so I guess going back to when the, when the recommendation was made by the IDMC back in March and when dosing was stopped, the what's an what's an IDMC? Sorry, so th this is an indep independent um, safety committee. Um, so based on an analysis by the IDMC back in March of last year, it was <clears throat> it was seen from the data that people receiving Tom and Urson, um every eight weeks, the outcomes on the, the CUHDRS, which is the Composite Unified Huntington's Disease Rating Scale. The outcomes look worse on people taking treatment every eight weeks compared to people that weren't on treatment. And based on that observation, the uh, recommendation from the IDMC was to stop dosing. And I mean, of course, that was devastating for the community. Um, and so 
when that happened, the next step for us was to, of course, look at the data from the, the core analysis. So that's, you know, comparing patients having treatment every eight weeks, having treatment every 16 weeks and, and placebo, but also to try and understand why we, why we saw what we did in the trial. And importantly, is there a way that we could find are there a group of patients who may be doing better on the drug and are there a group of patients that may be doing worse on the drug and what are the reasons behind that? And to do that, we met with our expert steering committee and we began with two core hypotheses. And that's two, two reasons why, well, two or three reasons why we thought outcomes may be different in different patient groups. And one of the reasons we thought this could be is that in terms of uh, disease burden, uh, which is sort of a measure of how advanced diseases or, or how progressed diseases. And so we looked at a number of things in terms of disease burden. We looked at disease stage as measured by total functional capacity score. We looked at the CAP score, that's, that's a, a multiple of the CAG repeat length and age. We looked at brain atrophy and we also looked at dose. So we looked at people having treatments every eight weeks and every 16 weeks, but we also looked at the level of tominersin in the cerebral spinal fluid when we take that sample before we give the next dose. So we looked at a number of different measures to see if we can predict what could, if there are groups that could be doing better and if there are groups that could be doing worse. It's really, really important to say with this type of analysis, it's called a post hoc analysis. And so, Typically in a clinical trial, you begin a clinical trial with a hypothesis. The hypothesis being, you know, can Tom and Ursa be beneficial in Huntington's disease? But in the post hoc scenario, you begin with a new hypothesis. And the difficulty there is that you're not able to, because you're not, because you're testing a new hypothesis, the results aren't definitive because you haven't, you haven't originally designed the study to test this new hypothesis. So that's what that's what post hoc means. And because of that, the results I could jump in there yeah. a bit, yeah. Peter. Sorry, just to Sorry, make I, that a little bit clearer. Concept. It's a difficult concept, and I but I think it's really important to kind of understand. So the phase three was designed. I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of um light coming in. Uh, I'll fix that later. Um so the phase three was designed and the numbers, the big numbers of um, eight, over 800 patients were specifically designed before the start of the study because we knew that that number based on the previous earlier phase of studies that that is the number that you need to be able to show statistical significance. It's what exactly. we call in science a, a powered study. So it's statistically powered to show the hypothesis or the outcome that we're trying to find. But when they do a post-hoc analysis, that was um, a step to try and find new hypotheses to, to explore later in a properly designed study. So exactly. it, yeah. Um, and so, so just to put that in context, the, the original study had 260 patients per group. Our post-hoc analysis had 60 patients per group, give or take around 50 or 60. So while it can give us an indication of, of what might be happening, it can't give us a definitive result. So what we've seen with that post hoc analysis is that patients who were younger with less disease burden as measured by the CAP score seemed to have a better outcome. It wasn't statistically significant, but that, that may be due to the, the numbers. But it does give, what we saw is that we saw potential benefit in that the average scores for patients having treatment every 16 weeks were higher than that of the placebo group in the, in the direction of, in the favorable direction or direction of improvement. While it isn't statistically significant, we saw the same pattern across all uh, measures in the UHDRS and that gave us confidence. And we, we then got more confidence when we split the subgroup and looked at exposure, the amount of Tom and Erson and CSF. And we found that the low exposure group consistently um, across most of the UHDRS measures had uh, better outcomes compared to placebo or even the, the high exposure group. So all, all this data in, in its, its entirety gives us confidence that we can identify a group who's younger with less disease burden. And if we go with a low exposure dose of Tom and Erson, 
then potentially we can see benefit. But importantly, the result isn't definitive and we need to do this in a new phase two trial that's, that has enough patients to be powered, Lauren, as you said, to give a definitive result in terms of statistical significance. And Peter, just to jump in and, and give a little background also for those that are listening in. So I, I come from an uh, HD family. I uh, tested positive. I am considered pre-symptomatic. And so when you say, you know, this younger group, you know, I'm curious, maybe if you can elaborate a little bit, if that's still kind of someone who's clinically diagnosed or are they pre-symptomatic? I don't know if you're able to answer that, but maybe... No, no, of course, of course. Um, so the, the Generation HD1 study, the inclusion criteria was that you needed to have um, a diagnosis of Huntington's disease. You needed to be manifest, and that's using the diagnostic confidence level four. So by definition, every patient in our study was manifest. And so uh, in our subgroup, everyone was manifest, but we were looking at, so we do what's called, so if we take all the patients in the study at the very start of the study and look at their age, and if we split that in the middle, that's called a median split. And so we were looking at the, the lower age, um, and also we did the same with CAP score, so lower age and lower CAP, but all, all patients had, had manifest HD. Awesome, thank you. And you know, that being said, I guess, like, you know, I, I've heard it before, just with companies, right, the goal is to try to treat as early as possible. So is that something that you think Roche is also interested in is, you know, maybe eventually, depending on data and everything to, to get into that manifest? So there, there's, there's definitely a move, I think, with, with, with everyone working in Huntington's disease to try and go earlier. And as we shared at the CHDI conference, we, we're in the very early stages of designing the, the study. And so everything is, is very um, preliminary. But the age group that we're looking at is between 25 and 50, um, with a CAP score less than 500. We're also keen to uh, consider the new HDIS staging system. And th this is a staging system that, that Professor Tabrizi um, and, and Jeff Long presented at CHDI. And it's really to try. He's actually and... going to be presenting later today in this oh, Congress. Okay. So okay. make sure you um, tune in for that because it will make a lot more sense. But, um, but yeah, it would. I guess the, the idea of the staging system is to try and um, have, have uh, well defined criteria, not just for manifest HD, but going earlier so that so that all of us can adapt a criteria that, that's better well defined than, than some of the terminology that, that we use at the minute that sometimes mean that means different things to different people. So we're 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 looking into adopting that. Um, and um, but I think the key thing for for us in the new phase two study is to replicate the signal that we've seen. Um, because I think the, the the first step for us is to be sure that what we see is 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 real, and and to do that we need this prospectively designed, you know, randomized um, powered study to do that. So that that's our first objective. Peter, could you explain a bit more about the concept of going back to phase two and what that means? Because I think it'll be important to set expectations of what that phase two is going, you're aiming to go in and find, because we're not going to be necessarily going in to find if it works per se to make patients better. That will be the, if you move to phase three after the phase two, but um, I think it's important for those who don't, maybe aren't as familiar with the development process of drugs of what, what that phase two actually means. Yeah, of course. So a phase two is, is is typically smaller than a phase three. A phase two, and so we, we we've shared at CHDI that we'll be exploring two different doses, and that um, those doses will be just slightly lower than the the, the Q sixteen one hundred twenty milligram dose that we we had in the Generation HD one study. Now with a phase two, it's not going to be the same numbers as Generation HD one. Um, it'll be smaller, and the objective will be to I mean, of course, see, see, see trends in the clinical measures and also to look at, at biomarkers like CSF mutant Huntington, like neurofilament light, 
um, but really to replicate what we've seen in this, this subgroup, both in terms of the clinical trends that we've seen, but also in terms of the biomarkers like NFL and, um, and CSF mutant Huntington, and also to look at things like ventricular volume. And Peter, you mentioned the, the CAP score a few times, and I, I know that there's like some equi right equation of like CAG times age or minus something age, like yeah. Do you, yeah. yeah. What is, what is that? What is what is that like? I guess equation. Like if I'm I like, think, oh, I'm curious what my cap score is, right? I I think it's really important to say with the cap score that it's a research tool. Um. So, so so cap is is a function of of um age and and CAG. And this was based on, on a study in the late 90s um, that showed a relationship between the amount of um, degeneration in the striatum um, for patients um, after, so this relates to patients after death, the amount of degeneration in the striatum um, that showed, showed that was related to age and CAG repeat length. And, and that was really the seminal paper that CAP is based on and disease burden and, and a number of other measures that are use the same age times CAG with, with a few tweaks here and there. Um, so that, that, can, that can explain um, the variance in terms of, or the variability, I should say, um, that can explain the variability of, of um, the progression or, or onset of disease and things like that by about 50 or 60%. But it's really important to say that there are lots of other factors that are also involved. Uh, you know, there are other genetic um, things that, that can have an impact. Uh, DNA repair genes, uh, we've learned a lot about in the last five years. Um, also environmental things. So it's important to say that the CAP score is only one bit of information and it's a research tool. It, it's, not, um, it's not highly accurate in indicating progression and things like that. So I just want to... Maybe to, to clarify that a bit further, I think it's maybe not accurate on, on an individual basis. Uh, so no, your CAP score is this, this is exactly yeah. how you're going to progress. But it's exactly. a useful tool for as we talk about going into patient groups that are earlier and we, there's different there's less ways that we can classify them and, and measure things it helps as a um an arbitrary kind of classification system and and things that you can we know that people with higher cap scores will progress more or this and it helps kind of predict what's going to happen in the study and it helps to design for, for track for companies like Roche to design things and, and hopefully get the right patients that they're going to see an effect in. So I, I think it's important to say it's not necessarily clinically meaningful to patients and individual gene carriers, but it's an important research tool that is used again. And when we see you know biomarkers and things that relate to it, it it's kind of um useful at showing that that biomarker is obviously related to the progression of Huntington's disease. And just to add to that, I mean, I, I appreciate the cl clarifying because that's definitely helpful because then I'm like, oh, what, what is my CAP score? And what is it? Does this mean I can participate? Right. But it's good to hear that it's individual, you know, kind of on an individual case by case and that it's only kind of one part of the bigger puzzle. But, you know, mm -hmm. one thing that I've, I've seen just from a lot of these companies working in HD is that sometimes, you know, I feel like the criteria is so specific that. I'm going to compare it to like, you're finding, you're trying to find this ideal patient. You're like, we need this patient. Like, it's like, kind of like, I'm going to say like the dating app. You're like, keep swiping until you it's find It's really hard. Um, I know, being on the recruitment hard. end of these things, it can yeah. be really difficult. Yeah. And, and so like, to me, I'm like, how do, how can the community maybe support companies like Roche when it comes to understanding what does that patient look like or what can we do to better support even just some of these efforts? I think, I mean, for, I guess, for Generation HD1, we had, we had quite a wide bracket. Um, and I think, and this is, this is part of the, part of the journey and part of the learning process where, you know, we've seen, we've seen from Generation HD1 that, you know, maybe, maybe the dose was too high, maybe it, it you know, it, it may be more difficult to treat patients who are more advanced. 
And certainly that's the, the, that's the sort of signals that we, we saw in the post hoc analysis where that the outcomes may have been less good in patients who were more advanced and, and, and potentially in patients who were on the higher dose. So I guess we, and I mean, we all wish that Generation HD1 had worked out differently, but I, I guess to, 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 we have to learn what we can learn and move forward. And I think, and one of, the, one of the points that I tried to make at CHDI is that none of us could do any of this without um, patient involvement. And particularly for Generation HD1, um, Charlotte Raven gave an incredible talk at the start of the conference, and it really outlined um, how difficult and how much of an emotional roller coaster Gen HD1 was for patients, not even Gen HD1, but all of the Tom and Arson programs because there was that excitement and, and I knew, you know, from when I was in UCL as well, just as a clinician, the excitement of, of having a drug that can lower Huntington, there was that excitement. And then um, to have the, the news back in March was devastating. But what I can say is in terms of how, to, how does the community help us? I mean, what the community does already is, is absolutely phenomenal to just by part partaking in, in, in studies means that we can learn and we can get we can get closer to treatments. Um, Wasn't the I think, um, recruitment yeah. of um, gener Generation HD like the, one of the fastest recruited yeah, I think, phase yeah, I think three it was trials ever? Yeah, the fastest recruited HD trial. Yeah, which, which it was, awesome. I was just going to say it's like amazing. That. Um, yeah, yeah, um, and, ju and just to just to add real quick, it's like it's awesome to hear that it was, it was extremely fast. And I think now it's just a matter of, you know, hearing this news, it can be challenging for community members. Cause like, oh, you know, you kind of lose this hope, but then it's like, how do we manage those expectations? Right. To say, well, here's another opportunity, perhaps, you know, Beth, it's important that you bring it up as well, because as we move earlier and younger, as you know, yourself and the campaign and you're doing Seth, um, it, I think there's one thing HGO is really passionate about communicating with pharma and companies to, how do we design trials that are designed at younger people that are healthier and still working and have children and and it's a whole different thing so that's something we're keen to keep talking to companies about um just for reference earlier charlotte raven is a patient that did the keynote speech at hd the hd therapeutics conference last week all the talks from that conference and i believe her keynote speech which was really really moving and i recommend everybody um watch it will be online on the CHDI website and we will share that um, on our social media when they come available. Um, but she was a patient in one of the large trials, Gen Peak, um, and she worked, uh, she was under um, our colleague um, Ed Wild, Professor Ed Wild, um, and he helped her with, with putting down her memoirs of her experience um, of, of finding out about HD in her family becoming symptomatic and and finding her voice again as um, a patient, and um, it was extremely moving. Um, another thing I wanted to say, silo in is about the criteria and, and actually the positive things that, you know, it is frustrating to patients of the limitations and the criteria. And I've, I've, I've talked many, with many patients that are desperate to get into these trials, but a, a big learning that we have from, from We've learned so much from Generation HD1 and we're going to continue to learn. And I think yeah. it's important to see why it's important to have criteria. It's not just to find the outcome, but it's also for safety. So there's something we're finding out that it might not be um, the brains of someone later on in HD might not be as, uh, it might be more vulnerable to any kind of toxicity or anything that, a, you know, the side effect that a drug could have. So. I think it's important to remember those criteria are there, not just, it, it's not just for straight patients or, or gene carriers, it's, they're there for either the scientific basis of what is going to be predicted to get the best outcome as quickly as possible and to, to, for safety. Um, I mean, our, 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 um, our primary sort of concern and focus is safety before anything else. So, I mean, the last thing, I mean, we want, and I as a clinician would want this to put anyone at risk. And I think it, I, I can understand why it's frustrating for patients, especially if patients are just on the edge of a criteria. And, you know, it may feel mean or it may feel, you know, can you not just make an exception? But 
I think we have to, I mean, safety has to be our primary um, focus because it's just, we can't, we can't risk putting anyone, uh, you know, put, putting anyone at risk. And, but it, yeah, I, I can under, understand sometimes at an individual level how, how that can seem. Peter, can seem it might be a good time to talk about um, what do we think went wrong or what, is there are you, are you getting any ideas from the data that it, is it Huntington lowering? Is it this drug? Is it? It's, is it's there any? It's a great more? question, um, and it's a question um, we hear all the time. So I guess what what I can say is that we see so we see this clear effect, and and we we showed analyses looking across age ranges as well, and at CHDI and across CAP scores, and there's a clear relationship with age and CAP in terms of outcomes. Lower age, lower CAP, but there's potential for for outcomes better than placebo. It's not not significant, but it, potentially there's a signal there and older age higher CAP, the outcomes are potentially worse than placebo, and 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 it's that potential worsening that that really gives us concern about at least with those doses going into patients who are older with higher cap. It's important to say that doesn't mean that uh, patients who are older with higher cap scores may, you know, they could still benefit from potentially other Huntington lowering therapeutic approaches or, you know, later down the line, potentially lower doses of Tom and Arson. But I think we have to, the first step for us is to follow where we've seen the signal and, and, and you know, other things could follow then after. Um, sorry, Lauren, I, can you remind me of your question? I, um, just, I think it's, you know, I know you can't speculate too much, but it, it's good to uh, kind yeah, of sorry, give an idea. Yeah. What are the possible things that could have went wrong? So and is there, there any hints? There's, so there's there's two distinct possibilities. One is the the... Uh, on target effects. And when I say on target effects, I mean lowering of the wild type Huntington and mutant Huntington. And it may be the lowering wild type Huntington be above a certain threshold may not be tolerated in some patients. It may also be non target effects, and that may be specifically related to the, the anti sense oligonucleotide or specifically Tom and Arson itself. It's 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 impossible to to disentangle these from the generation HD one data because the higher the dose, the more Huntington lowering that we see, but also the higher the dose, you know, if there are toxic effects, then they would be higher too. So we just can't disentangle them. But it's, I mean, it's it's sort of the it's the million dollar question, right? Um, but I mean, I think I think as a community, we will learn more about this as people use all their approaches, and we begin to see the data from other approaches as well. We do have like a minute left, and we probably could talk for another thirty minutes, hour, two hours. But oh, I thought we, we had longer. I didn't. Or do we? Maybe. I was gonna. Do we? I don't know. I was just oh, checking. 30, I mean, thirty minutes. Thirty. 30 minutes. Yeah. No. Cool. I know. I know. Um, well, one of the questions we had. It was, well, I'll start with what they said was everyone is so different upon onset of symptoms and, the, and then their progression. Um, the pre-symptomatic HD could meet the criteria and then not wishing we could do more pre-symptomatic trials. Is it easier to see changes or if the drug is working slash not with those that have symptoms versus those that are pre-symptomatic? Great question. Yeah, so... Yeah, it's it's easier to see changes with patients who are symptomatic because we can we can measure changes over a year or two years, for example, in patients who are symptomatic and patients who are pre-symptomatic. It takes longer to see those changes, and in any context where it takes longer to see those changes, it also takes longer to see if a drug works. So this is um, going back to kind of the post hoc idea of unscientific power. Um, the power and the statistical relevance of things are very based on what we call effect size, so how strong an effect that we can measure. Um, so it is by nature, if someone's later in their stage, you're going to see more change over a year than you would in someone who's pre-symptomatic. So you have to find ways that are more sensitive to early on in disease. So that's kind of some of the stuff that I work on on biomarkers. We hope in the future could allow us to, to run trials um, much earlier, but at the minute it would take to do that it would take 
you know, thousands of patients rather than hundreds uh, are pre-manifest carriers and it would take a lot longer to see the effects. So you need to know that a drug, a, you have to have a good rationale that the drug's going to work to, to condone running a trial that big that's going to be very expensive and long and, mm. and might not work. So that's yeah. why, you know, we all want to go earlier, but you have to have the right tools to measure effect and, and the right I, I think there is a big focus on the community to try and move earlier and to try and develop those tools. And that was certainly, you know, the HDI SS staging system is one of that. And, you know, a lot of work by CHDI. And I mean, everyone else in the community is really to mm -hmm. try and try, try and figure out what is the best way to do trials and in, in, in patients that are pre-symptomatic. But there is there's certainly a, a move and a focus on that. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm before we finish up, Peter. So you, I know you guys are moving towards the integrated staging system. I believe you mentioned in CHGI that the patients would be the new stage two and three, which if you go to Sarah's talk, you'll figure out what that is. But is it my understanding that you will move away from having an official diagnosis then? Because I, I think my understanding is that stage two, they wouldn't necessarily get the, the old school diagnosis of what, as we know it. So with our subgroup, we have a mixture of patients here, late stage two or um, early stage three. And as, as I said, this is all provisional because we're in the early stages of, of designing the new trial. But the, the where we are at the minute is we would want to look at that same subgroup with the with the, the, the initial objective to replicate the, the signal that we've seen. So that would be late stage two, early stage three in terms of the, the new system. The new HCI assess the safety system. Awesome. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you I think again. We have to finish up. I know, I know. I mean, I'd, so I'd be happy to talk for long as well. I know. Yeah. And um, I, I, again, I know um, that we'll be discussing the staging system later with Dr. Sarah Tabrizi and then Dr. Lauren Byrne will be on a panel. Mm -hmm. Uh, with a few others to kind of give some other research updates. So if you do have questions, I highly recommend checking yeah. those out. You can always also go to, uh, you know, the Roche booth along with other booths just to learn more throughout the day. But just wanted mm -hmm. to, you know, thank the two of you again for for hopping on and just having thank this you, conversation. Thank you, Seth. And but, I would love to hear hear people's feedback as well in this kind of format. If it's more useful to kind of have this kind of sit down chat, we we feel like it's a nicer way to to really hone in on the information rather than just a, a presentation. You know, the presentations are available online if you want to see the nitty gritty, but um, I think it's nice to have something more personable. So thank you so much to everyone. Um, I'm yeah, we're good, we're good. And, yeah. I, I will say we got some people are saying thanks in the chat. So you, we, we did mm -hmm. something. <laughs> we did something. But we did something. But in the meantime, I will say uh, the next presentation on track one is from Novartis about their trial. And then track two, we'll hear from Laura Duncan about how to prepare to go through genetic testing. So with that being said, thank you both again and uh, enjoy the rest of the session. Good, thanks. Thanks everybody. Right.